Well, happy feast, brethren. It is really a pleasure and a privilege to be able to be here with you today, to share the Feast of Tabernacles, to talk about what God has in store for each and every one of us. Greetings to you wherever you are around the world where God has chosen to place His name this year. We are here together at the Feast of Tabernacles, a, at locations where God wants us to be, at His invitation, and we're reflecting on the meaning of this incredible festival. God, a long time ago, laid out a plan for all mankind, and we are here on this sixth of the seven annual festivals, experiencing, practicing, rehearsing a time that looks forward to the millennial rule of Jesus Christ and the saints, us, on this earth. A time when Satan the devil and his demons will no longer be present. Their ideas, their thoughts, their attitudes, their emotions will no longer permeate the earth, but instead will be replaced by God's spirit and by God's motivation. It's in this backdrop that I'd like to speak to you today and to talk to you about an exciting topic a topic that will hopefully engage you today, that will pique your interest, but a topic that we will be deeply involved in for a thousand years and beyond at the return of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Brethren, what activities will the saints oversee during the millennium? What are we called to rule over in the kingdom of God? As we move into the millennium and we start preparing for the great white throne judgment period of time, pictured by the last great day that we'll talk about in a couple of days from now, what will we need to begin working toward with the coming resurrection of billions of people on the last great day? Brethren, how will cities in God's kingdom differ from the cities? that have been built and orchestrated by the prince of the power of the air, the god of this age. And why does it matter? Why do we need to understand concepts of cities in God's kingdom? Young people, I'm talking to you too today. I want you to think along with us about your future roles in the kingdom of God. Think about the society that we will help Jesus Christ build and develop around the world. If you're looking for a title of the sermon today, I've entitled it Building Cities in God's Kingdom. And I think you might be a little bit surprised at the detail that the principles in the Scripture and Scripture themselves talk about the insight that we're given into building cities in God's Kingdom. My purpose today is to help make the concept of cities in God's Kingdom clearer and more real to you. The reality is, brethren, that by understanding the concepts about cities in God's kingdom, our vision of the kingdom becomes more real, and so does the reality of our future roles. As we more powerfully look forward to our roles in the kingdom of God, our hope also grows stronger. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6 in your Bible, if you will, and we'll look at what the Apostle Paul had to say about our hope. God inspired this passage for our benefit, and it's something that gives us a powerful glimpse into the importance of having a very real hope, not some fictitious idea in our mind, not some cartoon, if you will, but a real hope that drives us forward. Hebrews chapter 6, and we'll start reading in verse 17. Hebrews 6, verse 17, Thus, God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. That's us, the heirs of promise. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ of that kingdom. But to the heirs of promise, the immutability of His counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable or unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. 
It's interesting wording here that Paul puts forth. He tells us that these are immutable things. This promise, this hope is immutable. It's unchangeable. God can't lie. And we know that that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. But we're told that this promise, that this hope, is a refuge for us to lay hold of. What's a refuge? When you think about a refuge, what do you think of? I think about some place safe to go where I'll be protected. And that's what this is talking about. This promise is protective to us. As we think about it, we understand it. We understand the reality of it. Let's go on to verse 19. He says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus Christ, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This hope, this hope of the kingdom of God, this hope of our future roles as family members of the spiritual family of God is our hope. It's what we look forward to. It should be an anchor for our soul when things get difficult in our lives, when trials are bearing down on us. It is this hope of the future, this very real hope of the future that should hold us fast in God's truth, that should motivate us to not bend, to not sway, to not leave the body of Christ or leave the truth. If our hope is real, if our faith in the promise of the kingdom of God is real, then we will not waver. And so as we talk about cities in the kingdom of God today, what I'd like to do is help build your hope even stronger and to encourage you to let God through His Word do that. Let's go to Revelation 5.10 as we again reflect on a scripture you've very possibly read already here at the Feast of Tabernacles this year. Revelation 5, verse 10, John's vision. <clears throat> he says, and he, let's break in here, and have made us kings and priests to our God. We know that our roles in the future are going to be ruling and leading as monarchs in the kingdom of God. That's why we're here this week at the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what we're reflecting on, these future roles as kings and priests. And it then says, we shall reign on the earth. We know that we're not going off to heaven to reign. We're going to reign on the earth with Jesus Christ, whose throne will be here on the earth in Jerusalem. Let's think for a minute. As we think about the kingdom of God, what are the four characteristics of a kingdom? For those of you who are old timers, you've been through this before. Mr. Armstrong taught us this years ago. But it's true. There are four very important things that a kingdom must have to be functional and to work and to work well and to be successful. You've got to have a king and leaders, don't you? Christ is going to come as the king of kings and lord of lords. So God's kingdom will have a king, won't it? You also have to have laws for a kingdom to function well. Otherwise, what do you have if you have a king and you don't have laws? You have anarchy, don't you? You have to have territory to rule over. The territory of the kingdom of God for at least the first thousand years, and plus the hundred or so of the white throne judgment, will be the earth. We shall reign on the earth with Jesus Christ. And then the fourth characteristic of a kingdom is subjects. Subjects. <laughs> you might have a king, and you might have rulers, and you might have territory, but if, and you might even have laws. But if you don't have people to rule, what is a kingdom? And so there will be subjects in the kingdom of God. During the millennium, there will be subjects to rule over, to reign, to teach, to encourage, to prod and push forward. They will be real human beings, flesh and blood human beings. A few billion of them, as we'll see in a minute, who live through the tribulation and then their progeny that comes later. Isaiah chapter 2. Again, you may have been in Isaiah 2 already, but let's go there together. Let's read a couple of verses here in Isaiah, these millennial scriptures that give us a snapshot or a glimpse into the rule and the reign of Christ and the saints on the earth 
and what human beings will be like. The reality that there will be human beings. Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house, the kingdom of God, shall be established on top of the mountains. Mountain in the scripture is symbolic of kingdom or kingdoms. So the kingdom of God will be above the kingdoms of the earth and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth, what? The law, that one of those keys to a, a functional kingdom and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He'll judge between nations, rebuke many peoples. And we see they're going to be physical. They're going to have a desire to overcome. They're going to have a desire to learn the way of God. And they're going to beat their swords into plowshares. If you're not physical, you don't need a plowshare. You don't need a pruning hook to garden with, to take care of things with in a physical life. These are physical people. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And you've heard some of that. You'll hear some more about that probably before the end of the feast. But what I want to draw from the scripture is these are real people, physical people that we will have the opportunity to work with. Isaiah chapter 11, another passage of millennial scripture that gives us a greater glimpse into what it's going to be like. The idea that there will be real physical beings, human and animal, in the kingdom of God. They will be the subjects of the kingdom, the millennium that we're here to celebrate and look forward to. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, you again may have read this already. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. Think about this. After Satan is taken away, after he is removed, his demons are removed, his ability to influence is taken away, he will no longer influence not only people, but he'll no longer influence animals. The mean, vindictive nature that we see in some beasts will be gone. When God's Spirit permeates the earth, it covers the earth as the waters cover the sea, even the animals will be influenced and will be tame and will be appreciative of being with human beings and be very gentle as we see here. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion, the fat ling together, and a little child will lead them. This is not a spirit being, this is a physical child. Verse 7, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall come together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. <laughs> Even digestive systems will change a bit. Now, verse 8, the nursing child. This is a small child from birth to however long someone decides to nurse. But this is a very small child you can take up in your arms. Shall play at the cobra's hole. The weaned child shall put his hand on the viper's den, and they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God, as the waters cover the sea. What an exciting time this will be. As verse 12, God will set up a banner for the nations. He'll assemble the outcasts of the Israelite descended nations and gather together dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And we read actually before that, God's going to recover a remnant of his people who are left from all these other areas of the, worth, of the world. Verse 10, we'll go back even more. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, Christ, who shall stand as a banner for the people, not only a leader. A banner is not just to lead, it's to show the people where they need to be. He'll be a banner for the people, for the Gentiles will seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. So God's not just going to work with the Israelite descendants at this point. He's going to work with everyone. Israelite and Gentile alike will seek him as human beings, and they'll want to know the way of God. Let's think now about cities in the kingdom of God. You've got all of these people. And you're going to need some place for them to go. How many people are we going to have that live through the tribulation? Well, when you run the numbers, you're talking somewhere around three and a half 
billion people, about half the world's po current population, will live through the Great Tribulation. How do we know that? Well, I'm going to reference a couple scriptures. Revelation 6, 8. We are given the example of the pale horse. <clears throat> the pale horse will ride and will kill approximately 25% of the earth's population, according to Revelation 6, 8. Later on, during the day of the Lord, the sixth trumpet plague, the 200 million man army that will come from the east, will kill approximately another third of mankind. So you just run those numbers. 25% um, reduction of 7 billion and then another 33% reduction of that remainder and you wind up with about 3.5 billion people. Half the Earth's population today who need to know the way. They need to be fed. They need to be clothed. They're physical human beings. And as they learn and they grow and they learn to overcome, as we work with them and we teach them, they're going to need a roof over their heads. They're going to need a place to live. <clears throat> Think about it. Micah chapter 5 and verse 10. Let's see what the prophet Micah was given to see in this prophecy about the kingdom of God. Micah chapter 5. And as you're turning to the book of Micah, what I'd like you to be thinking about and, and remembering is that prophecy is dual. Prophecy is dual. So Micah was writing to the nation of Judah that was coming apart at the seams back at the end of the period of the kings. But he was also writing to Micah 5 verse 7, the remnant of Jacob that shall be in the midst of many peoples. He's pointing forward here. Jacob being all the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> Micah 5 verse 10. We'll break in here. It says, And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from your midst and destroy your chariots. Yes, that happened before. But that concept, that idea will happen again. You know, people today who drive automobiles sometimes refer to their automobile as their chariot. The, the mode of transportation. God says, I'm going to cut it off. Verse 11, I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. Now again, he's talking to the descendants of Jacob. The northern ten tribes went into captivity over a hundred years before this prophecy was given. So he, he couldn't have been speaking to them. It was already done in the past. He's talking about the future. I'll cut off the sorceries from your hand. You shall have no soothsayer. So these pagan practices I'm going to get rid of. Let's continue. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. I will pluck the wooden images from your midst. In the end of verse 14 it says, I will destroy your cities. As we look around the world today, we see cities everywhere, don't we? Many of us live in them or near them. Most of us have traveled to them or through them. The cities as we know it today, and this is talking about the Israelite descended nations, will be destroyed. They will be destroyed. We'll get to some more scriptures on that in just a minute. But think about it. What are some of the end time events that are going to happen that are going to destroy some of these cities? We're told about massive earthquakes at the end of the age that will move mountains out of place. They'll move islands out of place. You think back a few years to the terrible earthquake in Haiti. And what did it do? What kind of devastation did it do? It didn't move the island out of place. All it did was shake it just a little bit. Well, it may have, may have moved a fraction of an inch. But it didn't move the island out of place. What happens if you take an island and you move it several feet or half a mile as tectonic plates on the earth shift. What will happen to the cities? You know, the, the cities in Japan are made to withstand earthquakes up to something like a 9.0 on the Richter scale. What happens if you get a 12 or a 15 on the Richter scale? Something that's totally unheard of. But when you begin to move mountains and shift islands, 
you're going to have destruction that is beyond comprehension. Human cities cannot stand up to that. They will be destroyed. And Scripture helps make that clear. Where are people going to live during the millennium if all of these cities have been destroyed? Where will they go? They'll be taken away. People are going to need a place to live. What will be the living conditions that we, as members of the family of God, design into society and direct humanity to begin to build? Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We're going to read a little bit of the parable of the minas, and it's the companion to Matthew's parable of the talents. The idea that God gives us first fruits, his elect, his called out ones, an incredible opportunity to learn and grow and develop the talents that he's given us in this life. And if we do that, we know there's going to be a reward. The parable of the minas, in the parable of the minas, God gives us an interesting perspective on that reward. Luke chapter 19, verse 17 it says, and he said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, because you were faithful in a very little. What does he say? Have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. He built these talents as well. And the master said, likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. What is the reward of the saints during the millennium? It's rulership alongside Jesus Christ. But our roles will be to rule over cities. But we just read that cities on the earth are going to be destroyed. These cities in the kingdom of God are going to be different than the cities we know today. The cities we live in, have been in, traveled through, perhaps are in as we speak here today. Entry into God's kingdom is a gift to us. We enter God's kingdom by His grace. We don't earn it. We work hard to overcome, and then God blesses us with a gift. But our roles and responsibilities in the kingdom are a reward for us based upon what we do and live today. Entry into the kingdom is a gift. Our roles and responsibilities reflect how we use our calling today. I have a question, or a couple of questions for you. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity to have a little discussion with the person or a couple people next to you. Husbands and wives, talk with each other. If you're here by yourself, lean over and get in on a discussion with somebody next to you. Please, I encourage you, literally get in on a discussion. If you're here with your children, make sure you engage your children, brethren. Talk with them or your grandchildren. But here's a couple of questions I'd like you to talk about with each other. What will cities in God's kingdom be like? From the scripture, based upon the scripture, I don't want you just projecting based on science fiction perhaps, but based on scripture and scriptural principles, what do we know about cities in the kingdom of God and what they will be like? Can you think of characteristics of what these cities are going to be like based on scripture and scriptural principles? What I'd like you to do is take about a minute and a half and talk with each other about this. Brainstorm. See what you can come up with. And then I'll re-engage you and talk to you some more about these things. Whoever's running the DVD player, please let it run. And we'll restart in just a minute. Go ahead. Talk about what these cities will be like that you will be reigning over. You've got one more minute.
Okay, time. If I can have your attention again, I'd like to bring all of us back together. You probably didn't have time to complete your conversation, and that's okay. I wanted to get your mental juices flowing. I wanted to get you brainstorming and thinking about what we're going to talk about in the remainder of the sermon. And in fact, I would encourage you to continue these conversations this afternoon at lunch or this evening at dinner, depending on what time of day this is being listened to. <clears throat> As we think about cities in the kingdom of God, we need to lay down some ground rules based on the scripture things we need to keep in mind as we look forward. We have to remember that one ground rule is that the designer of the cities in the world today is not God the Father and Jesus Christ, right? Who designs cities? Who's behind the design of cities today? It's the God of this age. Satan the devil, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 tells us that he is the God of this age. So as we think about cities in the kingdom, we've got to break th free of the mindset probably most of us have about cities. Satan operates usually to the opposite of how God does. So cities will be different. We also need to keep in mind another point that although we as God's spirit children will be able to create anything, we need to remember that humans do not need everything. Just because it can be done doesn't mean it's necessary. We, many of us, especially in the Western world, live in societies that have too much. We have so much stuff. We have so many things to do. Much of it's not needed. It distracts us from God and God's creation and God's plan and God's way of life. Satan has motivated a society to create distractions. As we rework cities and redevelop cities in the kingdom of God according to God's blueprints, one of the things we'll need to keep in mind is that just because it can be done doesn't mean it needs to be done. Just because we can create doesn't mean human beings need it. That's an important concept to think about, to meditate on, and even to pray about from time to time. Even as we reflect in our own lives, a lot of us have a lot of things, but do we really need all of the things we have? How helpful are they spiritually, emotionally, etc.? Another aspect that we need to keep in mind regarding cities in God's kingdom is many aspects of society facilitate us breaking God's commandments and principles. Satan has orchestrated a society designed to help us break God's law. And we need to think about cities in God's kingdom in a way that they, the cities, even the design of them, will help us keep God's law. Something to meditate on as well. We need to understand that cities in God's kingdom will be based on and built upon scriptural principles. They're going to be God's cities. They'll be done God's way. They'll be designed with God's perspective in mind. And so we'll talk about those perspectives today. We're going to hit some of the scriptures, just some of them. We don't have time to go into all of them. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 14 with me. Isaiah 14. We'll go back to Isaiah where we were a little bit earlier. <clears throat> Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 are two passages of scripture that Talk about the fall of Lucifer and really the development of Satan, the devil. Isaiah 14, we're going to break into Scripture here. God is talking about Lucifer's fall, and he's talking about those who follow him and follow his way. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 21, it says, God says, Prepare the slaughter for his children. Who is this him? This is Lucifer, the fallen angel, Satan, the devil, those who follow him. God says, prepare a slaughter for his children because of the iniquity of their fathers. Why? Why does God want to destroy them? Lest they rise up and possess the land and fill the face of the world with cities. God says, get rid of these people who've been molded and fashioned, if you will, by the God of this world. Their way of thinking, their way of approaching everything. 
will lead them to fill the face of the world with cities. What does that mean? That means that God does not like cities as they are designed today. God does not want cities. Has the earth been filled with cities today? Has the face of the world been filled with cities today? Yes, it has. According to the United Nations, over half of the world's population today lives in cities. Over half of the world's population, over three and a half billion people live cramped up, jammed up in cities. <clears throat> Let's look at another passage of scripture, Isaiah 5, 8. As we think about biblical scriptural principles for cities in the kingdom of God. Now, how can this be that God says, let's get rid of the people who are contaminated by Satan's way of thinking so that they don't fill the face of the earth with cities. And then God says, as we read in Luke, I'm going to reward you by letting you rule over cities. Is there a contradiction in the Bible? We know the Bible doesn't contradict itself. What's going on here? Well, the reality, as you've probably figured out, is that God's definition of cities is very, very different than Satan's. God's perspective on a city is very different than your perspective and my perspective on a city. We've got to keep that in mind. Isaiah chapter 5. As we look at a scriptural principle that will powerfully impact how cities are built and designed in the kingdom of God. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 8. God says, woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field. <laughs> They're connecting all of these things. Joining house to house. Have you ever experienced that experience? Being in a situation where perhaps living in or visiting a place where one house is joined to another? Perhaps a number of us are living in those kinds of situations here at the Feast of Tabernacles. If we stay in a hotel... Is not our temporary home dwelling connected to another temporary dwelling? If we're in a, an apartment or flat, a condominium, we're connected with someone by a wall or two walls or a ceiling or a floor. What happens when we're connected to people, when we're that close to other people? Let's continue reading here. God tells us, Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. When you're connected to people all over the place, you can't get away from them, can you? Whether you want to or not, you hear them. When we were first moved back to Charlotte a number of years ago, we were told we would be here for a short period of time, so we rented an apartment for several months. And we could hear the people next to us when they slammed a door or when they opened and closed a door, drawer, or when they yelled at each other. My wife and I were laying in bed about midnight, a Saturday or Sunday night, sleeping, and all of a sudden we were woken up by the television in the apartment above us. The television was so loud we could hear the dialogue and we were able to discern what TV program these people were watching above us. You can hear all kinds of things in situations where a house is joined to a house. You can't go out in your backyard without being seen by other people or heard by other people. God says, don't do it. Woe to those who join house to house. Why? Lest there's no place to dwell alone in the midst of the land. What did Jesus Christ do when he was on the earth in the evenings? He left the town, didn't he? He left the city. He went up onto a hillside by himself to think and to pray and to meditate and to reflect. When the disciples came back, I think it's Mark chapter 6, from their first missionary journey where Christ sent them out two by two, we're told that they were so busy in town that they didn't even have time to eat. What did Christ do with them? He took them out of the city, out of the town, went up into the wilderness so they could have some peace. Peace is important to God. When we look back at the Psalms and we look at David and we look at David's growth and his spiritual development, where did he do that? It was away from people, wasn't it? In the fields, in the pastures. He'd look up at the sky 
at the stars and, and muse on them and say, God, who am I that you're mindful of me? He'd look up to the hills. Talk about how Mount Zion stands most beautiful. The joy of all the land. God wants us to be in creation. He designed creation for human beings. He designed creation to bring human beings to the creator, not to be paved over with asphalt and concrete. As we think about the kingdom of God, houses will not be joined to houses. No more apartment buildings stacked high or stacked wide. It's going to be a different kind of a city. What do we see that are characteristics of cities in Satan's world? Cities that Satan has motivated the design of. What are some of those common characteristics? Number one, we see cities that are large and sprawling. Cities like Mexico City. Cities like Manila. Cities like New York. Like London or Paris. These massive, massive cities that just sprawl. It would take you in a car traveling at interstate or highway speeds an hour or two to drive across some of these cities, even if there was no traffic, because they're so large, so many people packed in. We see cities that are very highly, densely populated. Millions, in some cases tens of millions of people, all in a very concentrated area, which creates problems, doesn't it? You know, we, we brainstormed and we talked a few minutes ago, what are some of the problems that are caused by very dense cities. What are some of the problems? We see things like problems with waste and sewage disposal. What do you do with all the human waste? You put 10, billion, 10 million people in a very small area, everybody's got to use the toilet several times a day. What do you do with all of that waste? You have problems with other things. You've, you can't grow food in a city, there's no land because it's packed with people and buildings and concrete. And so you have to ship the food in. But to ship the food in without spoiling, you have to do something with the food. You have to package it, don't you? You have to create packaging that will help it last for a long time and not spoil. You have to preserve the food. What are other problems? You have major issues with sound pollution. You get so many people together Wait till after services today, after we say amen. Notice how quiet it is in the building that we're in today. You might hear some kind of a ventilation system going. You definitely hear the sound of my voice. Every once in a while you may hear a baby cry. But it's relatively quiet, isn't it? Listen. What will it sound like after we say amen at the end of this service with, I don't know, 20, 50, 100, 200, 500 people talking all at once. You put a lot of people in one place, the volume goes up. Of course, in big cities, because of the crime that comes with it and everything else, you've got sirens, you've got vehicle noise, you have the noise of airplanes traveling overhead. There's a lot of sound pollution in cities. What other kinds of problems do we have? We have increased mental health issues. And we know <clears throat> research will demonstrate, mental health research demonstrates, that mental health problems come in part because of a lack of peace and quiet. We know that people with mental health challenges, if they spend time in creation, will de-stress over time. Things like depression go away, yet we force people to live in these cities which increase mental health problems. Remember the scripture we read said there's no place to dwell alone when you join house to house. You put lots of people together, living together, you create massive population densities. You create artificial warming. If you put down lots of asphalt and concrete and you build these big buildings that are made out of concrete, they act as a sponge for heat. The sun comes up, heats them up, the sun goes down, but these things hold on to the heat and they release it slowly overnight. We know that cities usually are 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, um, 2, 3, 4 degrees C, warmer than the surrounding environment where you have grass and you have trees and you have shade. Also, cities with the big buildings break up the wind so you don't have breezes. 
that flow. It just gets hot and stays hot. What else about cities? They have to deal with overcrowding. And they require mass transit because there's lots of people that don't like to live in cities but have to work in cities. And so you've got to have some way of getting in and out. The further out you go, the more peaceful and the less expensive it is. Why do we have large cities today? Think about it. Why do we have large cities? Well, some of it can be due to lack of proper farming or famine. If you can't eat and you live in the countryside, you head to the city where there's food. It's cheaper usually to live in cities in many cases. You rent a flat, it's a lot cheaper than, and easier than maintaining a large parcel of land, paying the taxes on land. There are jobs in cities that pay better than jobs in the countryside usually. Cities are centers for interstate and international commerce. Why do cities spring up? To make money. What are the biggest buildings in cities as we look around? Biggest buildings. They're corporate headquarters for multinational, international entities that are there to make money for the owners primarily. It doesn't trickle down very well. The other tallest buildings in big cities, most big cities, are bank buildings. The, it's where we our places of worship. We worship money. <clears throat> cities are engines for economic growth. Engines for economic growth. A new company springs up, it wants to be near a city so it can have access to an airport, it can ac have access to ports along the coast, it can have access to trains, to trucks and lorries so that transit can happen, commerce can happen. We look at the motivation behind cities, behind the development of cities. Bring people from the country side, put them in cramped, confined areas with high levels of crime, with, high lev with expenses, with pollution, with lack of space, lack of peace, lack of quiet, <clears throat> with jobs, um, possibly less expensive to live in, more opportunity. Um, and centers for commerce. These are the motivations behind the cities of today. They're not godly motivations when you think about it. They're not godly motivations. How does God view cities? Well, we read just a couple of minutes ago in Isaiah chapter 14 that God says, get rid of these people who know cities because they're going to fill the face of the earth with cities. God doesn't like cities as the world would describe them. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 38. <clears throat> Ezekiel 38 gives us a glimpse into God's kingdom at the end of the millennium. It talks about Gog and Magog and this battle that's eventually going to take place between, between Christ and those who rebel at the end of the millennium. But Ezekiel chapter 38 gives us an, also a picture into society at that time, the end of the millennium. What will society look like? Ezekiel 38, starting at the beginning, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, make your face against Gog and Magog, the land of Agog and the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, prophesy against them. And then we'll skip down here and see what society is going to look like. Verse 10, thus says the Lord God, on the day you shall, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind. So these nations actually at the end of the millennium are going to rebel against God and his way of life, which is really something. That's a whole other discussion. He says, you'll make an evil plan. Verse 11, you'll say, I will go up to a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited, and against a people gathered from the nations who have what? They've acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. What are cities going to be like, or villages, as this is talked about? 
People are going to have livestock. They're going to have goods. You need space for livestock. We'll talk about it in a moment. You need space to store your goods. These are villages that are unwalled. Towns without walls. You know, many even personal homes today travel around the world and you see it have bars and gates and walls around the homes. Some of the nicer areas to live in some of our countries are walled, gated communities. And you have fences around your yard, in part to keep out intruders, in part because we build homes so close together, we want a little bit of privacy. We call them a privacy fence because we've broken principles that God puts forth. Zechariah <coughs> chapter 8. Let's see a little bit of Zechariah's vision into this time and what cities, villages will be like in the kingdom of God. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, <clears throat> I am zealous for Zion with great zeal. With great fervor I am zealous for her. Let's skip down to verse, or well, keep on verse 3 here. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 4, old men, brethren, note this. This is a vision of the way it will be in the kingdom of God. This is the way the capital city of the world will be. The capital city of the world will be the city that is to be emulated by all other cities around the world. And what will it be like? Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with a staff in his hand because of great age. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Those of you who live in cities, <clears throat> would you send your child or your grandchild out to play in the streets? Would you go just sit down in the street? No. Why? Because you'd probably be killed by a car or a truck that's driving down the road. Cities, city streets are avenues of transportation. <clears throat> What does this glimpse of cities tell us? What does it tell us? It tells us that vehicle traffic on these streets will not be there. It'll be few and far between, if at all. The city streets will be gathering places. Brethren, how different is that than city streets today? You take your life in your hand in many cities to cross a street. In God's kingdom, city streets will be places of communication, of relaxation, of fun, and of playing. How does that change the way a city functions? Let's go to Zechariah chapter 2. <clears throat> Zechariah 2, and we'll read verse 4 here. Again, a glimpse into this end time, similar to Ezekiel's glimpse. Uh, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 4. I'm waiting for my eye to fall on verse 4 here. Let's start in verse 3. And there was an angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming in to meet him, who said to him, Run and speak to this man, to Zechariah, who's having this vision, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. Very different than the Jerusalem of today. The old city has walls, and the... Uh, Israelis have built walls all around to segregate, to keep out the Palestinians, to protect themselves because they're afraid. So it will be as inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of the men and the livestock in it. If you've got a lot of people and you've got cattle, walls get in the way. People are not going to be living with cows, by the way. That's another biblical principle. You don't live with livestock. So there's got to be space. For I say, the Lord will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Cities without walls. <clears throat> uh, livestock. What does this imply about cities? They're going to be agrarian. Society is going to be agrarian. 
not going to be based so much on commerce. It's going to be based on agriculture. That's why people are going to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Think about it. What is a rule of thumb we need to remember about livestock? Let's think about a cow for a minute. We had the opportunity years ago to spend time living with cattle ranchers. And the rule of thumb with cattle is that one cow needs approximately three acres to be healthy. Three acres of good ground to have the grasses that are needed to keep it healthy. If you've got really unfertile land, you may need 10 acres per cow. So what if your family has two cows? You need about six acres to support them. What if you've also got maybe a small flock of sheep and a few goats? You need to expand that territory a little bit more. We're talking about space that's needed for people to live the way God wants us to live. <clears throat> There's got to be a lot of open land to support cattle. Think about this. Cities in the kingdom of God are going to need land. People will be spread out. No apartment buildings or high-rise residences. No homes joined to each other, condominiums or apartments or flats. Homes that are not too close together so that you can hear or see everything your neighbor says or does because there must be peace. Population density is going to be a thing of the past because people will be spread out, not miles apart, but spread out enough to have a few acres, five acres, ten acres. So you've got land. You can have your vine. You can have your fig tree we'll read about in a minute. We, you can have your, your small flocks or herds. Without high-rise or attached living situations, you cannot have dense populations. It is not possible. Thus, Cities in the kingdom of God cannot support cities like today. Mega metropolises, they can't happen. Even small cities of today, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people, that won't work if everybody has to have some space. We're talking about changing the way we think about society. Micah chapter 4. Micah. <clears throat> chapter 4. Let's look at a passage I just referred to a moment ago, Micah 4. Now, verse 1, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the mountains. This is a paraphrase of Isaiah chapter 2 that we started with. Verse 4, everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. We're overlapping scriptures here, but think about it. A vine, a grapevine, if you're going to support your family on a grapevine, grapevines grow pretty large. They'll grow 20, 30, 40, 50 feet long. It takes space to grow a grapevine. If you have a fig tree and it's healthy ground, the fig tree will be very large. It will be 20 feet across, 20 feet high. You're talking about something substantial here six, seven meters across and high. This is a large tree. It takes up a lot of space. So we're talking about people having fruit trees and fruit vines on their property. And you probably won't just have a fig tree and a grapevine. You'll have multiple grapevines. You may have a couple different kinds of fig trees, maybe some mango trees and pomegranate bushes and apple trees and peach trees. And we can go on and on so that you can support your family with those things. You don't go to the market to get these things when you have a little bit of land and you can grow it yourself. And when you have a more moderate climate where fruit will grow most of the year. Isaiah 25, Isaiah chapter 25. Let's go back to the vision that Isaiah had here. <clears throat> we read earlier about cities being destroyed. Will we rebuild the cities? When we come into the kingdom of God, Isaiah chapter 25, verse 1, O Lord, you are God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithful and truth. Verse 2, for you have made a city a ruin. Who destroys the cities? God. 
destroys the cities of the world. You've made a city a ruin, a fortified city a ruin, a place of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. God is going to destroy the cities of the earth and they are never to be rebuilt. We will design and help people build new cities, different cities. We're not going to reconstruct Satan's inspired cities. We're going to build a new God's inspired cities. I hope that's exciting to you to ponder over, to think about. Verse 6, in this mountain, God's kingdom, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces. Hopefully some of what you're enjoying at the Feast of Tabernacles this year. A feast of wines on the lees. These are wines matured in, on the sediment. Very different flavor of a wine if you've ever had that. A, wine, uh, a feast of fat things full of marrow. No, we're not going to break the principle of do not eat fat that we read about in Leviticus. This is a metaphor. Of well-refined wines on the lees. So as we think about this coming time, there's a, going to be abundance in God's kingdom, but people are going to drink wine. Why do we have grapevines? Well, yes, you can pick the grapes and eat them when they're ripe, but you can also pick the grapes and save them so you can use them throughout the year as matured wine. Something Christ said, I'm going to drink again with you in my kingdom. Pretty neat to think about. Where will all the space come from for smaller villages and communities? <clears throat> you know, some demographers, people who study populations, say that the earth can only hold about 9 billion people. There's not enough usable land. What's going to happen to give us some of that extra space? Isaiah chapter 35, turn back a few chapters. Isaiah 35, remember, at the end of the tribulation, God's going to lower mountains. He's going to move islands out of the way. Where do deserts come from? Think about it. Where do deserts come from? Deserts come from mountains. When you get very high mountains, you get something called a rain shadow effect. So if you've got a mountain here, and the, the clouds that are full of rain come from one direction, they hit the mountain, but they don't drop the rain on this side of the mountain. They cross over the mountain and drop the rain on the other side. So typically what you have when you have high mountains is one side of the mountain range is desert. The other side is full and lush. You see that with high mountains all over the world. Mountains create deserts in many cases. Other things create deserts too. <clears throat> but if you lower the mountains some, you get rid of the rain shadow effect. Rain falls everywhere. And what happens? Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom like a rose. What happens when you take the central desert that encompasses most of the land mass in Australia and you let it blossom like a rose? What happens when you take the Sahara that encompasses a huge chunk of the land mass in the central part of Africa and you let it blossom like a rose? You take the American Southwest, it absorbs about four or five states, six states, and you let it blossom like a rose. You're expanding the capacity of the earth to serve God's people, to serve people made in the image of God, to produce. The deserts will blossom like a rose. That's part of the area that space will come from. If God lowers the ocean levels and raises land, you're going to have more land to work with. And what's been under the ocean is liable to be very rich land. <clears throat> We also know that land is going to stay in families. I don't have the time to turn to Leviticus 25, but I encourage you to go back and read through it. Maybe tomorrow morning for your Bible study, read Leviticus chapter 25 and meditate on it. And think about the law that God is going to put in place when the Jubilee cycle, the 50-year cycle is reestablished. Land will stay in families. You're not going to be able to have large corporations buy up lots and lots of land forcing people into cities anymore. If, if you make a mistake financially, if someone in the family gets too selfish and sells their land, the land will come back to the family one way or another. Either 
When the person comes up with the money again, they'll buy the land back, and the temporary landowner doesn't have a choice. They have to sell it back. You'll read about that. Or, at the end of every 50 years, all land that is not yours reverts back to the original families. Land will stay in families, which is really exciting to think about. For the remainder of the sermon, I would like to talk about some different aspects of the society in the kingdom in detail. We'll talk about a couple of these. If you <clears throat> think about it, the water systems in the kingdom are going to change. For those of you who have background in engineering, um, civil engineering, this might be interesting to ponder over. How will the water systems change in the kingdom of God as we build cities, as we design cities? Think about it. If we spread people out and we don't have lots of people in one small place, we don't need massive water systems to bring water from afar into people. We don't need massive reservoirs anymore. You know, in New York City, you may or may not know, there are water pipes that run under the city. They, they run from the up part of the state. They run down under the city itself from dozens of miles away. The pipes are six meters, seven meters across, 20 feet high, and they're filled with water. There are so many people in New York City, you've got to have billions of gallons of water to take care of the needs of these people because they're there. You know, the whole concept of aqueducts was come up with because of human cities. You don't need aqueducts when you don't have massive population densities because you don't have massive water needs. If you have people on their own land, guess what? And it's raining all the time or raining as it needs to, water tables are higher and a, and a spring or a well can take care of you. You can also have something that many developing nations have, and we don't have this in developed nations so much. They're called cisterns, where you catch the rainwater, maybe off the roof or from other sources. But when you spread people out, you don't need massive water sources anymore. You don't need all the effort going into carrying all this water. You get rid of the need to put chemicals in water, don't you? When you've got massive water systems and you're transporting water over long distances, over varying temperatures, through pipes that they've been going, the water's been going through for dozens of years, you wind up with things like bacteria and protozoa in the water that will make you sick. So you've got to put a chemical in the water in order to make it healthy, healthier to drink. You get water from a cistern that's replenished every few days. You get water from a well or a spring in areas where you're not using chemical fertilizers anymore. <clears throat> So the runoff is not poisoned. You've got healthy water. You don't need chemicals in the water anymore. <clears throat> Cities of the kingdom will be like this. You won't have that kind of infrastructure need anymore. What about human waste management in God's kingdom, in the cities of God's kingdom? Human ma waste management. Think about it. If you don't have massive population density, hundreds or thousands of people living right on top of each other, when someone goes to the toilet, you don't have the waste issues anymore. You don't have thousands of gallons of human waste that you have to dispose of. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 23. Let's look at an old principle, an old principle that in some ways is new again <clears throat> as we work with developing nations. Either the WHO does this or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the U.S. works internationally. We're, we're coming back to these principles, this concept of burying one's waste. Deuteronomy 23, verses 12 and 13. Let's look at what God's command was. He says, you also shall have a place outside of your camp, not in your house, uh, not right outside your back door, but a little bit further away so you don't run into contamination issues, where you shall go out and you shall have an implement among your equipment. And when you sit down outside, what are you sitting down doing? You're using the toilet. You shall dig with it. So you've got a shovel. 
You shall turn and cover your refuse. So what do you do? You use God's creation. You use the bacteria and the microorganisms and the bugs that he designed in the soil to break down human waste. You go out, you do what you need to do, use the toilet after you've dug a hole, and then you bury it. And what happens? In a matter of days, in a healthy climate with healthy soil, the human waste is broken down and the soil is fine. And it doesn't run down into your water sources because your water sources spread away from it. God designed it to work that way. In fact, there's been quite a bit of research into designing pit privies, pit toilets, um, much like an outhouse. These things don't smell. They're clean, they're neat. They actually use a little bit of an electric current from, generated from solar power to heat the human waste and break it down at an even more rapid rate. We're probably going to have something more like this in God's kingdom. If you've got some space, a little bit of land, you've got a toilet system. <clears throat> you know, in the Western world, we have flush toilets, which are great. There's something to be thankful for. They get rid of waste. You don't have smells. It's clean, relatively, but it creates a massive amount of waste. Um, I found an article in Pipeline, a waste management new letter, newsletter from the summer of 2000. And it said that in the past, old-style toilets used roughly 9,000 gallons of water to dispose of a mere 130 gallons of human waste annually. Almost a hundred times the amount of water th than waste. So what do you do? You dilute the waste, you, you contaminate 9,000 gallons of water, and then you've got to do something with it. The only thing you can do is build a lagoon a lake, you put it all in there and then you throw chemicals in it to break it down because there's so much of it. And then you either shoot it off into rivers, lakes, streams, and oceans and contaminate that or you let it sit there and not only do massive amounts of human wastes sink into the soil, far beyond the soil's capacity to break it down, but also the chemicals in that waste break it down. In God's kingdom, things will be different with human waste much more efficient and you can do that when you spread out populations. Same thing goes with other types of human waste, trash, rubbish. When you have people living on their land, you're not going to have the amount of packaging that you have today. You're not going to need to be able to store things for long periods of time because you have fresh produce. You can reuse bottles. You know, it used to be that if you needed to get milk, you put it in the glass bottle, and when you're done, you rinse it, you clean it, you bring it back to the dairy, and they refill it. Not you use it and you throw it away. These concepts of waste management that are scriptural can work when you don't have cities as we know them. What about sleep patterns in electricity? We'll talk about one more concept here. Sleep patterns and electricity, Proverbs chapter 20. Verse 13, Proverbs chapter 20. What do we see in sleep patterns today of human beings? We do see a lot of people that like to stay up late. Maybe you're one of them. We see a lot of people that don't like to wake up early. But what does that force us to do with society and with electricity, with the need for power generation? Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 13, do not, oh, do not love sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you'll be satisfied with bread. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 9. Proverbs 6, similar concept here, verse 9. God says, how long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. We can go back to, and I won't go there, Proverbs 31, and we read about the virtuous woman who rose early in the morning before the rest of her household. The principle of early to bed and early to rise is a powerful one. For many reasons, we know from medical research that it's actually a healthier pattern to live in. You wake up early, you have a productive day, you go to bed early, and you wake up much more refreshed. The more hours of sleep before midnight you can get, the better the sleep is going to be, the more 
restful and the more productive the sleep will be in rebuilding your body. You can get just as many hours of sleep, but have more of the hours after midnight, and the sleep is not as effective in regenerating the body. Body. We get people into sleeping habits, habits where you wake with the sun and you go to bed not real long after sunset. What happens? Well, you're in a healthier sleep pattern, as we just said. What about power usage? You're not staying up late into the night. You're not using nearly as much power. You might actually be able to survive on candles, depending on the uh, area of the earth that you live in, how high you are or low you are in your hemisphere, close to the uh, poles. What else with electricity needs, power needs, electric power needs? If you get rid of cities and you get rid of crime, why do we have lights in cities? Think about it. Why do we have lights? One of the main reasons is to reduce crime. To reduce crime. We also have lights in cities because people are out and about at night after dark. If you're home at night, you don't need so much light around you. If you don't have population centers, then you don't need mass transit. Vehicles or trains, you don't need that anymore. There will be transit in the kingdom of God for certain. We can see it. But you don't need mass transit. So you're not pumping lots of energy into airplanes and boats and trains and planes and, and vehicles. Power usage in the kingdom will change. And one of the ways it will change is just because sleep patterns will become more, more godly, more biblically oriented. If you wake during the light hours and you sleep during most of the dark hours, you just don't need as much power to use. It's a lesson I learned a number of years ago. Uh, had the opportunity to travel to southern Guyana in South America and visit with our brethren there who live in a village with virtually no electric power. And what do you do? You go to bed when it gets dark or for shortly after that because your battery on your flashlight's going to run out. You get up early. When I was there, the sun rose about 5 o'clock in the morning. But I had gone to bed at 7.30 at night. I was ready to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And it made for a much more productive day. You get the cool of the morning to sit and do your Bible study. Wonderful thing. When you don't have cities, you don't have all those lights, you actually enjoy creation more, too. Years ago, my wife and I lived outside of Birmingham, Alabama. We lived 17 miles from the city center. And we couldn't see the stars at night because of the light pollution from the city. Many of you have experienced that as well. You turn out the city lights, you turn out the yard lights, and you see the stars. In a more humid climate, you see the fireflies, the lightning bugs that float around and blink. You have more of the creatures because the bugs are out at night. You don't have the smog. Present cities in God's kingdom are going to be different, aren't they? Cities during the millennium and beyond will be very different than they are today. God will make sure and see to it that the cities of today are destroyed during the tribulation and are not rebuilt. We won't need mega cities anymore, Satan's creation, because society will no longer operate on greed. There will be no need for international interstate commerce centers that are so abundant in society today. Yes, there will be some commerce, but not at the volume they are today because of the money that's to be made. There's going to be limited travel in the kingdom on roads, as we saw, with children and old people playing in the streets. Transportation is going to be different. It will be less, much less abundant. Everyone is going to be given a decent amount of land, enough to support fruit trees and vines perhaps some cattle. We think about Ezekiel 45 and 46. If temple sacrifices are reinstituted, there's going to need to be a significant amount of cattle. But not just for that. We can see elsewhere, we're going to be eating meat in the kingdom of God. We're going to be eating fish. We're going to be eating livestock. We're going to need to be clothed. We're not going to need to have shoes. Cattle take land. And we'll need land. Human beings will need land. The ones that we 
rule over and reign and teach. We'll need land to function in the way God designed them to. God's principles, brethren, prevent population density. No building of house to house will help ensure peace, quiet, personal space, better mental health and emotional health and physical health. Because of changed structures of cities, there will be no more need for inefficient public water and sewer systems. The elimination of cities as we know it and know them will lead to a change in our needs for power and electricity. Changes in sleeping patterns to revolve around sunrise and sunset will change our needs for power. Brethren, God's Word gives us tremendous insights into the physical life of the people in His coming kingdom, the millennium, the time we point forward to with this Feast of Tabernacles. God's design for cities are far different than those of the current God of this age, Saint and the Devil. God's design for cities and communities promotes health, mental health and physical health and spiritual health and it results in good stewardship of his creation the way he designed it to be done. God's design for cities will help put people back on track, put them back in contact with creation and the Creator. Brethren, I encourage you, keep learning to look even deeper into the Scripture and allow God and His Word to guide you into a truer, deeper understanding of what things will be like in the coming kingdom of God. Meditate on these things through prayer. Brethren, we're called to help turn this world right side up at the return of Jesus Christ. One way we'll do this is by guiding human beings who live through the Great Tribulation to build cities based on God's designs and God's principles and God's laws. What will it be like in the communities of God's kingdom? How much better and different will they be? God's Word gives us a glimpse into that soon coming reality. Brethren, for your homework this afternoon, Yes, I'm a teacher. Uh, there's more than one reason I love working with Living University and talking to you. But I have some homework for you, hopefully fun homework. <clears throat> I'd like you to look around at the environment that you're in here at the Feast of Tabernacles. Some of you are in the countryside. Some of you are in cities. I'd like you to, with your family, with your spiritual family, discuss what you might keep and improve upon in the kingdom of God. Look around you while oh, you're here. What aspects of the society are good? Because it's a mixed bag of good and evil. What aspects of society would be good to keep and integrate into the societies you will help develop in the kingdom of God, the cities you'll help develop? What aspects of what you see will you eliminate in the kingdom of God? It's been wonderful speaking with you today, brethren. I hope this topic has gotten you a little bit excited about the soon coming kingdom of God in the cities that you are called to help design and build and teach through. Have a wonderful remainder of the feast.